a fishery supervisor for the Upper Missouri River Fish Management Area. I'm just going to talk like this because I don't like leaning over. So I'm Mark Fensel, Fish Supervisor for the Upper Missouri River Fisheries Management Area. Welcome everybody to the Lake Oahe and Sharp uh, Fishery Public Meeting. Uh, tonight we're going to have two presentations. Uh, Lake Sharp, uh, our newest biologist, Liz Redder, is going to go through some of the findings from this year and kind of talk about how for next year. After that, we're going to have a Lake Oahe update with Dylan Grabenhoff, another one of our biologists uh, in the Fort Pierre office. Um, but then comes the, the meat of the night, and that is the question and answer portion. Uh, the presentation should last about 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes in total. I do ask that we hold all questions till the very end, that way we can answer them all. And uh, if anybody wants to leave after the presentation, they'd be more than welcome to leave. Uh, more than welcome to leave. Um, we will say we have this room till 9 30, 10 o'clock. So uh, if you have any and all questions, you know, stick around, either uh, give it to the group after the presentations or find us after the meeting and we can talk one on one. We do have several park staff here uh, and some law enforcement staff. So if you have any parks questions, law enforcement questions, feel free to uh, bring those forward. Um, with Liz and Dylan, we also have our other two biologists in the Upper Missouri River Fishery Management Area here tonight. Dan Jost from Mowbridge, so if you have any questions on the fisheries up in Mowbridge. And Bob Hens here too that uh, can answer any of the questions re regarding salmon on Lake Hawaii. So I'm sure there'll be a bunch of them. And I don't think the microphone is working yet, so I'll give it to Liz and write it speak up. Liz Renner. All right, thanks Mark. Um, and thank you all for being here and for your interest in the Conservation and Management Department of Missouri River Fisheries. Um, so we'll get started today talking about uh, Lake Sharp. I like to refer to Lake Sharp as our live fast, die young fishery with respect to walleye. Um, so Lake Sharp's our second smallest reservoir along the Missouri River, 81 miles long. It's about 80 feet deep um, in, uh, in some of its maximum depth areas. It's got 200 miles of shoreline, and we have our two bordering tribal partners with the Lower Rule Sioux Tribe and the Crow Creek Sioux Tribe. Um, so when we survey Lake Sharp each September, um, we deploy 50 uh, standard gill nets set randomly at uh, depths of 6 to 60 feet. Um, and so this map in the upper right hand corner kind of shows you the distribution of those nets um, that are generated randomly um, each year. So we try to get them dist distributed so we have 25 nets in the upper and then the lower part of the reservoir. So jumping right into it, um, so Lake Sharp uh, for walleye conditions, so this is the relative plumpness of the fish, right, like relative, um, our, our condition for the fish, increased in 2023. So you'll note um, for that uh, blue line here, um, so especially for uh, the 10 to 20 inch fish, so, so we had increases in our, our dashed red and our gold lines, you see some increase, and then a, a more gentle increase, um, a subtle difference in our uh, fish over 20 inches. So a slight increase in condition uh, for walleye out there this year. Yeah, just zeroing in on all right, next up, so um, when we talk about walleye management and our, kind of our target goal, um, we, we want um, 15 inches in three years, right, in terms of walleye growth. And so that's kind of our statewide target uh, for management. Um, and Lake Sharp is really consistent. So we've got gizzard shad out in the, the reservoir, and that gizzard shad um, really keeps consistent growth rates uh, through time. And so, uh, as you can see, uh, growth rates declined just slightly beneath that 15-inch uh, mark in three years uh, in 2023, but we're still pretty consistent um, with our long-term average. Um, for uh, relative abundance, so our, our, we've got our walleye abundance here, so this brown is uh, our 10 to 15-inch fish. Um, the lighter tan is our 15 to 20-inch fish. And then that purple sliver up top is our um, fish greater than 20. So as you can see, there are very few fish out in the system um, that are above uh, 20 inches. So like I said, we're a live fast, die young fishery and shark. Um, the majority of our biomass in the system, our, our abundance, is locked up in those um, fish <coughs> that we're sampling that are 10 to 15 inches. So we've got a lot of shorter fish in the system. 
Then when we look at our length frequency, um, you know, so we've got our 15 inch minimum length limit on Sharp, um, and we see that reflected in our length frequency data too for 2023. So um, that uh, highlighted bar there at uh, 38 centimeters is right at our um, 15 inches, and so you can see that there are a lot of fish that are stacked up right beneath that minimum length limit, um, and that's pretty standard. We, we tend to see that over time in Lake Sharp, um, and that rang true again this year in 2023. And then with respect to age frequency, like I said, you know, in Lake Milwaukee, we see um, much older fish, but um, we don't tend to see those older, older year classes in Lake Sharp. Um, and so, as you can see, uh, so the, the 2023 um, year class, we wouldn't expect those fish to show up in our fall surveys. They haven't recruited to our gear yet. They're not large enough to show up in our field net surveys. Um, but as you can see, we had pretty consistent catches across the 2022 through 2020 cohorts. We had a really large uh, cohort in 2019 on Sharp in uh, conjunction with that high water. They got a great spawn off that year. Um, and so that was the, um, as we can see, we have younger fish that are really dominating um, the, the abundance in that lake. So um, that's our age frequency distribution. Next up, folks always ask us, you know, how's the fishing pressure this year? Um, and since we had uh, kind of a banner year in Lake Milwaukee, I think um, some of that pressure that we normally see on Sharp might have shift shifted north. Um, so pressure was down a bit in terms of um, number of angling trips. So this is with our remote car counter data. Um, so we were able to extrapolate that. And as you can see, um, 2023, the angling pressure was down um, across Lake Sharp. So to summarize, um, in general, walleye condition is stable over time in Lake Sharp. It uh, increased slightly in 2023. We had a slight decline in growth rates for 2023. Um, we see a lot of the fish in Lake Sharp are stacked up beneath that 15 inch <coughs> length limit. Um, we've got a large 2019 year class of walleye still moving through the system. And we saw a slight decline in fishing pressure in 2020. So that was a summary on our, our walleye management. Next up, I'm going to give, give a brief overview of our progress that we're making on our paddlefish recovery program on Lake Sharp. Um, and so uh, some of you guys may know that uh, paddlefish declined in Lake Sharp after dam construction, and they were presumed extirpated by like the late 1980s in the system. And so they were first reintroduced into Lake Sharp in 2015 um, in collaboration uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and so since 2015, between 17,000 and 44,000 juveniles have been stocked annually. And we think these stockings are becoming successful. Um, so we're starting to see anecdotal reports, you know, we see in our um, dive surveys in the Milwaukee Dam tail race, we're starting to see uh, paddlefish in those surveys. And then we're also, um, you know, observing at the surface, we're, we're seeing individuals at Fort George, we're getting a lot of reports from anglers and the general public, public that they're seeing these paddlefish around town. Um, and so uh, Game Fish and Parks started collecting um, and tagging adult paddlefish in the Stilling Basin in 2022. So um, over the course of several weeks in 2022, we set out there in, uh, with floating gill nets, and we were only able to capture and tag three adults. And now this past May and June, um, over the course of several weeks, we were able to tag 34 individuals. Actually, over the course of just a, a couple day period um, in late May, we were able to tag um, the majority of those adults. So um, it's pretty exciting to see, see those fish starting to show up in the Stilling Basin, and we plan to continue tracking those fish and tagging as many as we can going forward. All right, and then next up, I'm just gonna um, do a quick summary of, uh, for some of you may know, we've been doing a, a smallmouth bass tagging study on Lake Sharp. Um, so uh, in the past, you know, we've got growing interest in our amazing uh, smallmouth bass fisheries uh, here on the Missouri River. Um, and so uh, there's concern now with, you know, increased in uh, interest and angling pressure on these smallmouth bass fisheries um, that we might need to um, reevaluate our, our harvest regulations. Um, for smallmouth bass. Um, and so our objective for the study was to estimate angler exploitation and natural mortality of the lake shark smallmouth. Um, and then we wanted to estimate our angler reporting and tag loss rates for those tagged uh, lake shark, shark smallmouth. And then to evaluate those current harvest regulations um, for lake shark and compare those to other Missouri River reservoirs. And so um, in 2023, uh, we tagged about 2,000 total bass. 
Um, so 1,850 non-reward tags and then 150 bass were tagged with high reward tags. And those were split evenly between these six tagging zones throughout the reservoir. Um, and so we tagged these fish between May 17th and June 14th of 2023. Um, so our goal was 2,000. We managed to tag um, 1,831 fish. Um, and so you can see we had a pretty good distribution of um, tag by site. Unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, tag many fish at, at, at to tag any fish at West Bend, um, but we got really good numbers at uh, Good Soldier, Joe Creek, Iron Nation. So we kind of got some distribution throughout the reservoir. And then just to show you some preliminary results, we had 286 total angler reported catches, um, including 252 non-reward uh, tags and 3,400 reward tags reported. Um, so that's a 29.8 percent catch rate of reward tags and a, about 52 percent uh, non-reporting rates, um, with 35.3 percent harvest rate of the reported catches. So we're looking at about 10 percent angler exploitation so far. Um, so we're really pleased um, with the data coming in so far and the, the reporting rate, you know, the, the uh, participation in this study. And uh, we ask for those of you that are out on Lake Sharp targeting those smallmouth to continue to reporting, uh, report your tags because we <coughs> um, can make use of that information. And with that, we'll transition. I think we got the mic figured out. Can you guys hear me a little bit better? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so like Mark said when he introduced me, my name is, my name is Dylan Gravenhoff. Uh, I know I've met some of you, I've been here last year, but um, just want to thank you guys again for coming out. We're, we need GFP is really excited where Blackie's at fishery-wise right now, and I think judging by how many folks showed up and whatnot too, I hope you're really excited with what's going on out there. We heard from a lot of anglers this year that multiple people said that this is some of the best fishing they've seen on Milwaukee in quite a while, and that's reflective in what we're going to see here with their data. Um, so just kind of a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start out with talking about some recent stockings that we've been doing on Milwaukee over the last handful of years, both walleye and shad. Um, and then we'll, the primary and what I'll talk about is kind of what the current walleye trends. We'll talk about the lower end and the upper end separately. And then towards the end, I'll talk real, real briefly about our cold water crayfish surveys, what we saw for angling pressure in 2023. Um, I'll throw a little bit of information at you on what the Corps has been giving us regarding snowpack this winter, what that might mean for boat ramp access, stuff like that. Um, talk real briefly about um, AIS in Lake Waukee, and then some of our plans going forward. Um, so as far as management on Lake Milwaukee, we manage basically two zones. Um, as you guys know, it's a really big system, and honestly, the lower end and the upper end function very differently. They're the same fishery, but they almost act as two different fisheries, so we kind of manage it uh, in those two zones. The upper zone is everything for us is from the North Dakota State Line down to the 212 Bridge, near by Whitlock Bay, and then the lower end is from the 212 Bridge down to Oahe Dam. Um, historically, like I was saying, the upper end and the lower end function differently. Historically, the upper end has always had a higher abundance of walleye, um, but generally a smaller size structure. But with that, um, they're generally better recruitment, reproduction on that upper end. Um, and then compare that to the lower end, there's typically less walleyes, but they're bigger. That size structure is bigger on the, on the lower end. And generally, weaker recruitment, reproduction, we just don't have as good of spawning grounds and stuff down on the lower end as we do on the upper end. So we won't go into too much historic stuff. I think we're far enough past the 2011 flood, we can kind of stop talking about it a little bit. We're about 13 years past a little bit. I think everybody's pretty familiar with what happened with the fishery after the flood. It was pretty pretty drastic. Our saw pretty extreme declines in the walleye population. Fish were out there starving. They got washed in the dam. They were just dying left and right out there. Um, this was uh, particularly extreme on the lower end. I mean, things were down across all of Oahe, but definitely the lower end of Oahe took the biggest hit. Um, we, like I said, we lost fish, but then the, really the big driver is that condition and the growth rate really plummeted. it. Um, but in the next few years following the flood, things be, kind of began to recover on their own, particularly on that lower end. 
We saw, we started to see Cisco come back in the system, that crane base started building back up, and things were looking uh, better. So what did we do to start combating this? We started stocking fish. Something we've never done, or I should say never done, there was a few uh, experimental stockings back in the 90s, I think, on Milwaukee, but other than that, we had never stocked walleyes on Lake Milwaukee. So admittedly, a lot of us biologists didn't think it was going to work. It's, I mean, you look at how big of a system uh, Lake Milwaukee is compared to like our eastern lakes and stuff, and when we talk about putting like a million fingerlings in Lake Milwaukee versus Bitter Lake, I mean, it's a drop in the bucket. We never thought we'd be able to stock enough fish to actually turn the corner. But we started, we figured we'd try anyway. Um, like I said, from 2017 to 2022, most of our stockings were focused on that lower end. Um, we knew things were bad like, all across the system, but things were kind of holding our own on the upper end, so we really focused in on that lower end uh, where things were pretty bad. Um, that's where we saw the most drastic declines in numbers of walleyes and that condition post-flood. Like I said, the upper end had some decline, but they were, they were kind of holding their own a little bit. We thought they were in a better position to kind of naturally recover. Um, so the little table on the bottom left, that's the numbers that we stocked um, from 17 to 22. You see that we stocked fish every year. The fry stockings um, weren't too important. Those weren't necessarily our goals. Those are more so driven by our hatchery out in Guam Bay at Extra Fry. Um, they were looking for a home, so we offered up to take those. But really what we were trying to do was stock those finger lake fish. Um, 2018 and 2021 were our biggest stockings, and then we had a couple smaller stockings in between there. Um, the map on the right-hand side that just kind of illustrates where we stocked all those fish, you'll see it really focused on that lower end of Lake Oahe. Um, and then with that, uh, in 2012, continued through 2022, we started stocking the other chat. Like I think you, everybody probably knows that prey base in Lake Oahe really took it on the chin after the 21 flood and there was fish just out there starving. Like I'm sure you've all seen the pictures of a walleye with a head that big and a body two inches tall. They were just starving to death out there. So before we wanted, before we could start stocking walleyes, we needed to get some kind of food out there for them. Um, so these stockings of shad are pre-spawn adults. Uh, primarily, we collect them out of Hippo Lake on Lake Shark. Um, pre-spawn, move them up to Oahe with the intention of hopefully they can pull off the spawn up there, produce a bunch of little fish for food, um, and yeah, just provides a prey source that way. Gizzard shad are fairly thermally regulated, so we're, we're aware that most times they don't survive over winter very well, so that's why we continue stocking them every year, hoping that some of them will produce some food, knowing that most of them will die, and we're going to have to keep doing that annually. Um, those are just the numbers over the last handful of years, and then the same uh, map kind of showing where we stock most of those. Most of those went in on the lower end. Um, we wanted to pair those with our walleye stockings. Obviously, we can put walleyes out there. We want to get them something to eat. Well, we did do some stockings on the upper end of Lake Hawaii, and actually we sent some fish up to North Dakota where they stocked them just over the state line. Um, so like I was saying, we kind of went in not really sure if this was going to work, and spoiler alert, uh, it's been working pretty good. We were actually really surprised and uh, really happy with the results that we were seeing. Um, so that kind of leads us into uh, what we started stocking. In, well, I should say, so following those stockings on the lower end, we saw increasing walleye abundance, uh, improving growth after the flood, and pretty stable condition. Um, so that led us into 2023. I think we all know after some of the meetings last year, things were still kind of slowly declining on the upper end. So we wanted to shift focus last year and start stocking the upper end of Lake Milwaukee. Um, so these numbers are the walleye stockings that we did this last May, June. Um, like I said, focused almost entirely on the upper end. We had a couple stockings there on the lower end at Mekonju and Spring Creek. Those are actually extra fish that the hatchery had once they met the statewide goals. And we're looking for a home, so we stuck a few down there, but the majority of them went up on the upper end. And we stocked 3.7 million fingerlings. That is by far and away the largest stockings that we've ever done on Lake Wahi. If you remember previous to that, I think our highest was like 2.1. So we nearly doubled that this last year. Um, these are all the locations that fish went in. I won't 
go through them all, but you can kind of see there. Really kind of focused in that low bridge area, Swan Creek, Whitlock, kind of that was kind of our hub where most of those fish went in. Uh, and then you can see on the map there the locations that we put them. Um, and then with that, we want to continue those shad stockings like we talked about. <coughs> for putting more mouths out there, we want to make sure there's food for them too. Um, so again, we kind of focus all those shad stockings also on the upper end of Lake Lahey. And we moved just over 1,500 adult shad out of shark and moved them out there, which is again, same as our wall has the largest stocking that we've ever done. Um, there's the numbers we put about almost 700 in Pollock, some in that Lowbridge area, and all the way down to Whitlock. Um, so now we'll get into some of the walleye data that we got from our gill nets last year. Um, the way I'm going to frame this, we'll go through all of, just for simplicity, we'll go through all of lower Milwaukee first and then we'll switch over to the upper end. Um, pretty much all these graphs on the y axis, so the up and down, those are our number of walleyes that we caught per gill net. Um, and then generally it's a uh, year on the x-axis. So if you see over there on the right side, that's our, that's our catches from 2023. Um, the highest catch, walleye catches we've had on the lower end in the last seven years. So we were really happy to see that. And even more so on top of that, that yellow bar in the middle, that's a 15 to 20 inch fish. So if you compare that to the previous six years, it just blew it out of the water, the number of those either size fish out there. I think that's reflective of what the anglers are seeing this year. We heard from, like I said, we heard from a lot of people how good the fishing was this year, and that was reflected in our nets there too. Uh, the purple bar is our over 20 inch fish. Um, net, we don't really see much change there. I mean, not a lot of those fish get to that large size structure. It's pretty uh, static over the years. And then the bottom one is our 10 to 15 inch fish. So yeah, it's down a little bit from the previous year, but it's pretty much right on the line for what we've been seeing. So we're pretty happy with what we're seeing there in those gill nets. Um, this is the light frequency, like Liz said. So once again, number of walleyes per net. And then this is length on the x-axis. So that yellow bar, that's 15 inches. Just kind of give you a visual, a visual of what 15 inches is there. Um, the first thing that pops out to me is like the nice thing, a lot of those fish are on that side of the line, right? I mean, that's the size where people typically start harvesting those fish. So it's good to see a lot of those fish exceed that 15 inches. Um, the other nice thing to see is you kind of see these distinct breaks between peaks. Um, generally what that means, we'll get into it, but means that there's pretty good growth really for, for the wahi fish. Um, basically, that first little blip, that's like age one fish. That's, that's the first time that the fish are big enough to, that we catch them in our nets. And then there's a little bit of a break between the, until the age two fish, then a break to the age three and four and whatnot. So generally when you have good growth, it's good to see those breaks in between them. They're, that means the fish are growing slow and stockpiling on top of each other. Um, talk about walleye condition, like Liz kind of talked about, that's like the, the plumpness or, yeah, basically the condition of the fish. Um, kind of the red dotted bar that from 80 to 90, that's generally what we call good condition. So anything inside that box we're pretty happy with. Um, you see the two big dips. The first one was after the flood in the late 90s, um, when condition really bottomed out, improved for the early 2000s, and then 2011, the bottom kind of fell out again, and the condition really went in the tank. Uh, but we have been seeing things improve pretty, pretty well, and actually in 2023, we saw a pretty good jump in the condition of our walleye. So and they're right in that goal area that we're shooting for, so we're happy with the condition of the fish out there right now. Um, growth, like I was talking about a couple slides back, um, like Liz talked about, kind of a, honestly it's a Midwest goal almost, that for an age three wall, like kind of the, the target is 15 inches. If you can hit 15 inches by age three, that's pretty good, pretty good growth. And actually the lower end of Lake Wahi has looked pretty good. We saw a little bit of a dip in 22, uh, but nothing really concerned about. But then in 23, our fish actually are exceeding 15 inches at three years old. Um, so pretty happy with what growth is looking like on the lower end. Um, so this graph is, um, so all the walleyes that we catch in our gill net, we pull the little oolith bone and age them so we know what year class they came from. Um, the red stars on here, I put those on there. Those are the years that we stocked walleyes on the lower end. The two big stars, those were our biggest stockings. 
The two small stars are the years that we stock very little fish, almost, almost none, just a very, very small amount. Um, and the biggest thing that popped out here is that big 2019 um, bump. If we remember back in 2019, we had really high water, really good conditions for the spawn. And although we did stock a few fish in 2019, I think Mother Nature really showed us how much better she is at producing walleyes than we are. Um, if you look at 2018 and 2021, yeah, we stocked fish in those years, but those are actually a couple of our lower year classes. So it's not that stocking's bad, but it, it just shows how, how much better Mother Nature is at producing walleyes. Um, the other thing with the 2019 year class, so those would have been age four fish this last year, right? So if they're hitting 15 inches at age three, those age fours are probably in that 16, 17 inch range. So that year class is really the driving the fishery that we saw in Lake Lodge this year. And where those fish should stay in the system and we're looking forward to continue seeing them grow. Uh, but then it looks like we have a couple decent year classes coming in behind them. So uh, pretty happy with what we're seeing there. So that's it for the lower end. We're going to switch to the upper end now. Basically all the graphs are going to be the same, just focusing on that upper end of Lake Oahe. So this is our, uh, once again, the number of walleyes that we caught per gill net, and then our years on the x-axis. And you can see in 2023, our catch is on the upper end, just moving out of the water compared to what we've been seeing the last few years. Honestly, almost, almost double what we've seen any other year previous. Um, Really big increase in that 15 to 20 inch fish there in the middle. And I think that's representative of what folks were seeing angling up there this year. And then the really promising thing is that those 10 to, it looks like there's another really big batch of 10 to 15 inch fish coming in the high um, Important thing to note here, so we did stock walleyes in 2023. None of those would have been big enough to be caught in our nets this year. So none of the, none of the stockings we did there are representative in that big bar. That's, I mean, there could have been some stocked fish from the lower end, but those are likely all natural fish up there. Um, same length, length frequency that from the, as the lower end. Um, not as many exceeding that 15 inch mark, um, but still better if I compare this to the graph from 2022. This looks a lot better than it did last year when we shared this. Um, but you can see there's still a big, pretty big stockpile in that kind of 10 to 15 inch range that was open this upcoming year will uh, exceed that. Um, kind of what I was talking about on the lower end when you saw those distinct uh, breaks between years, you see how everything just kind of jumbled on top of each other here. That kind of makes sense when we look at the growth rates for the upper end. But, um, condition, uh, kind of the same deal as the lower end, right in that kind of target range that we're shooting for for walleye condition, and actually all size classes increased in condition in 2023. So there's more fish out there and they're in good condition. Um, growth on the upper end, um, we were kind of seeing this over the last handful of years, we were seeing this slow de decline in growth, which made us a little bit nervous about stocking fish on the upper end. Right? And you're seeing poor and poor growth, maybe not the wisest thing to do to stock more fish on top of that. But we actually saw things increase uh, pretty good in 2023, while we were, uh, which we were happy about. Uh, I threw the 15 in, or the 15 and the 14 inch line there. So I mean, it looks like it's they're way below 15 inches at age three, but they're really almost right at 14 inches. So they're they're not lagging too far behind the lower end. We're pretty close there. If we can bump that up a little bit, we'll be right where we want to be. Um, same year class graph for the upper end. Um, same deal, 2019. Um, it's really driving the fishery out there right now. I mean, four-year-old fish on the upper end is probably right at 15 inches. So if those will grow a little bit more from last year to this upcoming year, um, things should be looking pretty good on the upper end. And then the other promising thing is you look at 2020, 2021, and 2022, there's looks like three pretty big year classes coming up through the system, um, which we're excited about. And then 2023 is the first year that we stocked up there, so we'd expect we caught just a couple of those fish, which is not it. Or not surprising because they're not very big by the time we do our surveys in September. Um, I threw this graph up here just because I know some folks asked about it last year. This is basically just uh, when we run our gill nets on Oahe, this is all the fish that we catch in our nets. So on the lower end of all the fish that we caught in our gill nets, about 30% of them were walleyes. Um, 
The next two big ones are catch a lot of channel catfish and smallmouth bass on the lower end, and then kind of everything else makes up about a quarter of the catch. Um, pretty similar on the upper end, 34% of our total catch of walleye. Um, the biggest difference is we see a lot less smallmouth bass and a lot more channel catfish, which if you ever come out and help us run meal nets on the upper end, you'll know that's true because we pick a lot of the catfish out of the nets. Um, and then everything else is just kind of a smattering mixed in there a little bit. So in summary, on the lower end, 2023, we had the highest walleye catch that we've had over the last seven years. Um, particularly, we saw a large increase in that number of 15 to 20 inch fish, which I think the anglers are seeing too. Uh, particularly for those 15 to 20 inch fish that our catch was over double that we've seen um, in a year previous, 17 through 22. Um, and then not only did we have more fish, but uh, both walleye condition and growth were good and improving, so we're pretty happy there. Um, upper end, pretty similar story. It was by far and away the highest walleye catch we've had over the last seven years, but remember it just kind of blew it out of the water. There's a really big spike in the number of those 15 to 20 inch fish, which I think everybody kind of saw coming a little bit. We've heard over the last couple of years how many short fish there were and whatnot, and this is so showed as those fish grew stayed in the system and grew, they finally surpassed that 15 inches. But there's also, looks like there's a really big batch of uh, younger, smaller fish coming in behind them too. Um, walleye condition on the upper end was good and improving in 2023. Um, growth for the upper end was still below that 15 inch target, um, but we did see it a good increase from 22 to 23. Um, as far as stocking plans going forward, I know this is something a lot of people are interested in. So in 2024, uh, we plan to continue with our adult shad stockings that we've been doing. Um, we don't have a great way to like formally evaluate this, but uh, we've been hearing from places that we stocked and whatnot, folks are reporting that there's a bunch of little shad out there. They're sh seeing shad in the stomachs of fish. Um, so just kind of anecdotally, it appears to be working, so we want to continue doing that. It's not gonna hurt anything. Um, so our goal for 24, is to stock about 1,700 shad, um, 250 per site, and that's spread across the whole reservoir, um, all the way from Pollock down to Peoria, just trying to get those fish all over into the system. Um, for our walleye stockings for this upcoming year, our goal, our request is 2.7 million fingerlings. I say that's a request because everywhere in the state, they put in their, our hatcheries can only produce so many walleyes, so everybody puts in the requests and whatnot, and then they need to prioritize stuff like that. So that's never a set stone number, but that's what we're requesting. Um, and then those fish will be spread between those six sites there on the lower end. So we've kind of, we want to get into this rotation where it's not necessarily ideal to stock uh, every single year at the same locations, because uh, if you get too many fish, kind of stockpiling on, on each other, that's where you start seeing that uh, decreasing, decreasing growth um, and condition and stuff like that. So we're kind of looking into getting this uh, alternate where one year we'll stock the upper end, next year we'll stock the lower end, next year stock the upper and so on, if it's needed. So that's what we're looking at for 2024. Um, 2025, kind of hard saying until we get there, but uh, we are for sure planning on continuing our shad stockings. That's a given. Walleye stockings, um, like I said, they'll likely be focused on the upper end of Lake Waukee. Not gonna throw a number out there yet until we see what our catches are like in 2023. That'll, be, that'll really dictate what our goal is. If growth continues to improve, condition improves, there's no reason why we can't stock again on the upper end of Lake Waukee. But that will be determined based on what we see in this upcoming year. Um, so just real briefly, looking at our cold water prey fish surveys, we get a lot of questions about smelt and Cisco and stuff like that. Um, so the top graph, that's just kind of showing um, the we do our hydroacoustic surveys um, without getting into the weeds too much. It just kind of shows the abundance of Cisco in the system. Um, actually, maybe let's start with the bottom. The, the bottom is rainbow smelt. So you see in these first few years up to 2011, the first four bars, that's uh, well, 2011 and before, there was a lot of smelt in the system, and then flood happened, and kind of the bottom fell out as far as our smelt populations. 
But the promising thing is there's a, been kind of this consistent increasing abundance in smelt since the flood. It hasn't gotten back to where it was pre-flood, but we've seen more and more smelt in the system pretty much every year since. Um, and then looking at Cisco, that's where the difference is. So pre-flood, um, Cisco really weren't a factor in Lake Oahe, but when the smelt came out, basically came out of the system, there was this void out there, and Cisco really stepped up and filled that role, and really had been driving the prey base on Lake Oahe for the last decade. Um, kind of the same trend. Um, we've been seeing increasing Cisco numbers over the last decade too. So things are looking pretty good, crayfish wise. Cold water crayfish, that is. Um, angling pressure. Um, preface this by saying I, I wish I could have got a little more data on there. I guess we did see a decline in fishing pressure in 2023. I would argue you see the two big bumps was in 2020 and 2021. I think we've all pretty heard that fishing in general really spiked during COVID. I mean, every state in the area saw that uh, number of licenses sold went through the rough. Everybody didn't have anything better to do, so they went fishing. Yes, it's been declining the last couple of years. I think it's, if, you, if we could go back a couple more years previous, I think it's just kind of going back to what it normally has been. Um, you, you see from 22 to 23, it declined a little bit. Um, but I think it's probably leveling off to a more normal level of what it had been pre-COVID. Um, maybe the interesting thing here is, so the blue bar is the, low, is the number of trips on the lower end, um, and the red bar, whatever color it is, is the upper end. Historically, we've always seen more fishing pressure on the upper end than the lower end. But I think what everybody's been seeing in England in the last couple of years with how, things good, have, how good things have been on the lower end We've kind of seen that flip flop the last three years where there's actually more pressure on the lower end now than there is the upper end. Um, so, this is that snowpack graph from the core that I mentioned. There's a lot of digest here, but basically, the graph on the left is what we call like mountain snowpack, that's everything um, upstream of Fort Peck. And then the right graph is plain snowpack, so that's basically everything from Montana kind of down. Here on the plains. Um, the red line going up there, that is, uh, I think it's like a 20, 30 year average of what things typically are for snowpack. Um, and then the blue line's the highest and the green line's the lowest. This blue, like solid bar, that's what we're at this year. So things, I think it's about 50% snowpack <coughs> to what, from what we normally see on an average year, and then kind of the same story for the plain snowpack. So what that means is I think we all know how quickly that can change. We can get some big rainstorms and things can really come up, but it's hard to say, but it's looking like we're probably gonna have some more water coming up here on Waukee in the next couple of years, which I will say, I know I saw some park staff in the room, like they've been fantastic about opening up low water access and stuff like that. So if there's any questions on that, I might refer to that a little bit. But um, just wanted to kind of throw that out there so folks kind of knew what might be coming down the pipe here this coming year. Um, AIS, won't talk about this too much. I'm guessing most people have probably heard about it. So we did find the first adult zebra mussels on Lake Wahi this past fall. Um, generally when park staff pull uh, boat ramps out, we, we have staff go around and inspect those pretty thoroughly most times. That's a good place to find. If there's going to be zebra mussels, we'll find them there. So we found two adult mussels uh, attached at Cow Creek and one at East Shore or Shore Bay. Uh, so based on our current guidelines, that, that was enough to qualify Lake Waukee as being infested. We're well aware that it's probably at a very low density right now, um, but we wanted to just make sure that people were aware that we did find some in there. Uh, so I should say plans for 2024, but kind of we got asked by folks, well, does that mean we're stopping boat inspections or what are we doing there? We are going to continue to do watercraft inspections to help slow that spread. Um, obviously, like I said, uh, densities of zebra mussels are, should be super, super low right now. So it could take years to spread on Oahe. It could take one year. We don't really know. So we're going to continue those efforts to hopefully slow that spread. Um, I'm sure you guys are all aware the last couple of years we've primarily been doing roadside checks um, where we're stopping people on the highway and whatnot. 
Um, this year, 2024, we're gonna prioritize doing more exit inspections at high use ramps, so your Spring Creek, Cow Creek, West Bend, Whitlock, Swan, some of your higher use areas where we're gonna be stopping people as they come out, making sure their roads clean, drain, dry, um, and they know uh, that they're not spreading anything with them. Um, that being said, we might continue to do some roadside inspections um, if it's deemed necessary. Um, at the end of 2024, we have plans to do some thorough boat dock inspections with Park staff again to see if we find them anywhere else. And then sometimes over the summer, we have interns or staff that go out and do snorkel surveys in some uh, high risk areas like Walking Dam. We might have some folks snorkel around on the face of the dam looking for mussels and stuff like that. So that's where we're at AIS wise. And that's all I have. So I guess we'll open it up. Yeah, thanks Liz and Dylan for the uh, presentations. Um, now is the fun part. What, uh, what questions do you guys have on any of the information presented or the, the plans going forward? Be happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah. The fever muscles, um, I guess the lake drops enough to let it expose and kill them off? Or will it It'll it expose the ones that are shallow and kill those. Um, the zebra muscles can attach at least down to 20 feet there's some new studies coming out that they actually catch below that even so you'd have to drop the elevation very quick in 20 minutes <coughs> where they relate more to the sunlight for growth and stuff like that uh, yeah it's pretty much where there's hard substrates and where there's plankton for me so granted the majority of those zero muscles are going to be in that first 20 feet of depth but there'll probably be some that are deeper a good example of that is like Lake Francis case where they do a big like, 20 foot drawdown in the winter. Um, can it knock a few of them back? Yes, but they're still super prevalent down in the Francis case, so it's not enough to fully eradicate them. What's ramp access going to look like if we stay at 50% of the That's a uh, crystal ball question you know we oh what is with the water right now but yeah I was gonna say if the water stays the way it is right now we're gonna have good access but you know with the the snowpack outlooks and stuff you know your guess is as good as mine with what this summer's gonna look like um, we've had very wet marches actually the Yellowstone River flood you know that was all rainwater that came in last spring um, so we have a long ways to go and you know we could be high we could be low next year I would just say um, we're going to continue to have access throughout this summer um, because of the low water development that we did in the mid 2000s. We'll transition if it does go below our high water ramps. We'll transition onto our low water ramps. So based on the latest forecasts from the Corps of Engineers, our high, high water ramps should service us through most of the summer. But of course, those forecasts are kind of all null and void until we. You know, until we get to April, that's when we really start keying in on those four forecasts. Exactly, Pat. There's a lot of winter left, especially in the mountains. Pat, can I ask you one more question? What are, their, <laughs> what are their projected uh, releases this summer compared to last summer? Because I know last year we were all getting excited the water was coming up on Oahe, and then they pumped it out like crazy. As far as the forecast information, Scott, I really can't answer that at this time. Um, that's projected through the coral law office. Is their projection lower though than what they were pumping last summer or is the projection about the same? No, no. May I that? I can't, no. So the coral will come out with that. Their first uh, spring projection will be in March. So yep. they'll get the snowpack in March and that's where they'll come out with their, their early season barge or early season uh, flow projections at that time. Then they'll do a a mid-season checkup in July as well. So March will be the time that we start seeing what projections look like. Like I said, April is when I really start to key in on that. Okay, thank you. So last year you guys said you were bringing a shad up to Kansas, whatever happened to that? That was a big flop. <laughs> we attempted. We attempted very hard. It did not work. We missed the spawn by a couple weeks, unfortunately. By the time we got down there, we were already seeing, you know, days post catch shad. So we were really disappointed that our partners in Kansas, some of these folks I worked with for my dissertation research, and I thought that they were going to do more reconnaissance for us, and they didn't. So, yeah, that was a bust. Is that a plan going forward? 
anything's on the table. Um, the hard thing with shad is that they're tied to water temperature so closely that you can be down there looking for weeks in advance and not seeing anything, and then when it's time to go, it's time to go. That's how we run on sharp when we are good at moving shad is because we're out there almost every day waiting to see when they're moving in, and that window of time is so narrow. Trying to coordinate that with another state agency is difficult. Um, so it's definitely not off the table. We've had discussions on looking at some, uh, some different reservoirs in Nebraska even, someplace closer to, to move those fish. But uh, as of right now, nothing's planned for 2024. Ideally, I, I would love to have a source that we can bring in. You know, our goals last year were, you know, tens of thousands, you know, 10,000 shad, bring them all up, anything we get our hands on, but it just didn't work out. How many, uh, Harvest about I don't know as a lot of you. Probably 180 million total out of the state, somewhere mm -hmm. around there. I, mean, I don't know. The only place we spawn out of the water is right there. We got in the lanes because of access. Yeah, but we were in for a short period of time and we had to get up to the bottom of the well with spawn and so far. I think we probably did. That's what I would guess. I don't know specifically for the grant, but we had our the statewide goal we had with you know the northeast and the southeast all contributing. Actually, southeast did really well last year collecting eggs. So once we hit our goal, we wrap everything up. How many salmon did you have that How many what? Salmon. I bet about six hundred sixty thousand. We uh, I think we ended up taking just shy of six hundred thousand eggs, salmon eggs. Um, Overall, the number of salmon that returned up the ladder was below average. I think it was around right around 600 fish. Uh, our long-term average is around 800. Um, so, from our collection stuff, we ended up we're going to end up with about 220,000 fish. Plus, we got some additional eggs from outside the state. Um, we're actually looking at uh, the second largest salmon stocking we've done since the 1980s is what's projected to go into Lake Hawaii this year. Last year uh, would have been the largest one salmon number that we've stocked since the mid 80s. So we're, we're over probably three times the average number of salmon we, we stock on an annual basis. Trying to boost that up so one, to see better returns and more fish available for anglers, but also easier for us to collect eggs and keep the program going. question if you wanted to contact uh, our fish chief John Mott and talk to him about it but um, yeah looking there there's been some discussions with Northern State as well up in Aberdeen um, and then on top of that you know the, the hatcheries in South Dakota have been amazing they've been building their own grass systems on the hatchery you know re, uh, redefining certain buildings putting in hatchery you know tanks and stuff like that um, they've actually been building capacity at our current hatcheries almost every year the pounds of fish that we're raising in our hatcheries and the facilities we have have been increasing every year. Um, but yeah, we have we do have discussions out there to uh, increase the number of hatcheries. So they probably the biggest hold up with say SDSU is when they first started discussing it, they're hoping it might cost around five million or something like that. I think the latest projection they've gotten is like thirty million. So which makes things a lot more difficult.
So you got you got question mark on 25 per stock. Obviously, you got to see the fish. But is there ever going to be like a 10-year comprehensive stocking plan on the system? And why is that? Because we need to look at the data before we say we're going to stock 10 years out. You know, if we see growth go in the tubes and condition go in the tubes, we're not going to keep stocking on top of it. You know, we need to let those fish actually grow. Um, now, with that being said, I think we're pretty confident we can turn that growth around pretty quick with our gizzard shad stockings, with warm water crayfish. Um, it, it's amazing what shad can do in that system. So it might only be a year or two that we don't stock, um, but everything is based on those two conditions, growth and condition. Well, if we look at North Dakota, they stock pretty much every year and it works. So it's a very different system though. They also didn't lose the smelt in 2011. That's true. I mean, if we had the, the prey base to support it, yeah, there's no limit to what we can put in there as long as growth and condition keep going. Put the coals to the fire the whole time, but we're limited by our great fish. Dylan, could you talk a little bit more about the size structure of the airing and the smell of the lobby or some of those airing kind of getting to the point where they're not as accessible or are they are still in good shape? No, uh, things are actually, that was, that was a concern we have because we had, after the flood, when Cisco really started to take in, and there started to be a ton of uh, Cisco out there, we were just concerned, like, there's always anecdotal, like, you see some really big Cisco, but I think there's so many of them out there that they actually started to stunt, and most of the Cisco we see now, they pop out at 8, 9, 10 inches, well, maybe kind of that range, so, obviously, it's still too big for a 15-inch walleye, probably, but... I think that's really, I mean, there's been all the buzz around state records and stuff like that. I would really speculate that those big fish are really cued in on those big systems. So they might be too big for some of the fish, but. Yeah, and in this deal, stunting is a good thing. I mean, we don't want those Cisco to outgrow the predator size gap with you know, our fish out there in the system. So slowing them down and, and those stunting to a smaller size is actually a really good scenario for us. With Cisco. Very rarely do you hear a fish biologist just say they want them to be stunned. <laughs> 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 we want the Cisco to stunt the wall to grow. Bush's road. The road you know. So the road, the road to Bush's land. 
So the uh, the plan for the state is to have improvement at Bushing Land Colt Ramp itself. Okay. With that development, which that process, I was talking to Tom Fryer up there earlier, that's still in the works with the Corps of Engineers, trying to meet their specifications, come up with a plan. That plan's going to require a lot of riprap and material that's hauled across that road surface. We will not be making any repairs to that road surface to tear it down before we start any construction up in that area. Um, right now, it'll be in the same condition, graded gravel, uh, mag water condition on a portion of it as it was last year. And bushes, based on the forecast, that ramp should be in service throughout the majority of the summer is my anticipation. But we do have an agreement with Sully County yeah. working towards a you know positive outcome for everybody. Any other questions? Well, thanks everybody. Um, like I said, uh, a lot of the GMP staff will probably stick around for a little bit. So if you have any one-on-one -on -one questions you want to ask us, uh, we'll be here. Take those questions. Thanks for coming out, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.